Welcome back to UVA Data Points. I'm your host, Monica Manning. In today's bonus episode, we're deviating a bit from our central theme. As many of you may know, the UVA School of Data Science was recently formed in September of 2019. And since that time, the school, in collaboration with external partners, has been developing, planning, and now constructing the facility that will house the School of Data Science. People who are local to Charlottesville, or those who have recently visited, have likely noticed all the construction at the intersection of Emmett and Ivy. This construction is the first phase in the development of the Ivy Corridor. Once completed, this new development will create a link connecting central and north grounds. And at the entrance of this corridor will be a 60,000 square foot building that is a future home of the UVA School of Data Science. So today, we're bringing you a conversation between Alice Roucher, an architect with UVA, and Mike Taylor, an architect with Hopkins Architects. Both Alice and Mike have been instrumental in the building's design. Alice has also played a key role in the development of the Ivy Corridor. In this discussion, Mike and Alice take a deep dive into the thought process behind the building's design. They also discuss the topography of the area, the challenges of adapting to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the significance of the Ivy Corridor to the wider UVA and Charlottesville community. Also, a heads up for our data science listeners. Mike and Alice briefly discuss some of the building's ability to capture data, particularly as it relates to sustainability. So we're hoping to see some interesting data science projects once this building opens. And so with that, here's the conversation between Alice and Mike. I'm Alice Rauscher. I'm architect for this uh, incredible university, as you all know. Um, uh, so happy to see you here today in person. Uh, we've had a couple of years of just Zoom and just meeting outside, you know, hours ago uh, in person for the first time. So this has been one of the delightful byproducts of, of the last two years of, of um, uh, pandemic. But let me turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Well, as you know, I'm Mike Taylor, a principal at Hopkins Architects, and we actually knew each other before on another professional project for another very good American university. Correct. So we have some history, which is always useful and really positive. Um, and I have led the project for the uh, SDS new faculty. All right. So we're here today to reminisce, have a chat, and have a conversation that hopefully brings out some of the key things um, that have developed in the in the briefing and the concept of the design and give you a bit of a feel about where we're going to take this project, what it's going to be like, and um, some of its really sort of salient features. So I guess a good place for us to start is for me to ask you, uh, why did you choose us for this project, Alice? Well, that's a, that's a great <laughs> question, Mike. Uh, and I have to say that, uh, you know, we've had some really amazing projects in the last few years, and we've been very fortunate to have the have had the interest of of many very good architectural firms um, you know over the past couple of years and uh, this project in particular was very important to us not only because it was going to be a representation the the built aspect of a brand new school for the university so it was significant in that aspect but it was also going to be the cornerstone of the development of an entirely new district which really was um, in the vision of the university for quite a long time, and it wasn't until you know the last couple of years that it's come to fruition in terms of a design. So, so the selection of the architect was very important, um, and we uh, had a lot of interest in terms of the qualifications and letters of interest from various firms, and then we narrowed it down. And I would say that Hopkins, in particular, uh, stood out because of your past work and your approach to. Uh, you know, not only the history of our place, you know, the history of the mm. institution, the appreciation of the of our existing architecture, but also the ability to, to look forward and think about what a new uh, building for a new district and a new school might be on a campus that has so much um, history to it. Yeah. And so that was the, the approach to the interview. I mean, number one, you were selected to be shortlisted because of your past work yeah. and your and your approach. Uh, described approach, but then during the interview process, it was uh, quite significant that you understood, you know, what it's like to work in a historical context and still breathe new life and a fresh approach. And I would say teamed with BMDO Architects, our local firm, they do uh, a lot of work for us. They also know us very well. They too, you know, have a very good sense about them, but it also seemed that the team was very well orchestrated to understand who was doing what. 
uh, who was providing the vision, who was providing the backup. So it made a very strong team, and, and the, and the um, choice was very clear for us. Well, that's, yeah, it's inter- interesting to hear in hindsight. I mean, I guess um, it's really great to have VMDO there as a, as a local knowledge, a safe pair of hands, because we come in, I mean, almost deliberately not knowing about you. And, and for us, that's almost a positive on all our projects. We do have a history of kind of technical excellence and innovation and therefore being quite um, innovative um, and, and contemporary. But we also have a very strong grounding in, in context and historic sites. So I guess everything you've just said about your particular project, um, we'd like to think we can c- cover those two things. But not knowing about something is quite often an advantage. So we've done velodromes, opera houses, children's hospitals as one-offs and all those disciplines have specialists but sometimes by not being the specialist and by taking everything apart and thinking forensically about what's needed you can hopefully build back a story with the client, with the end user that is more adapted to exactly what's needed and and a a new look uh, a fresher look and hopefully that's the direction we're going to take this this project in um i guess just it's good to kind of carry on on the on the bigger story about where this fits into your campus and the particular i mean it's a real focal point isn't it and mm-hmm. it's really it is a really challenging project because it's starting a new place maybe it's good for you just to describe about the particular relevance of that site how come that p- particular position was chosen and and, and, yeah. and the, the wider context for the university yeah. and the town that's that's a really good point and if i could just go back for a moment because i and you, something you mentioned earlier on about how you and i had had some overlap you know at yale where um, Hopkins, as you, as you know, being the principal, yeah. did a really beautiful building for Croon Hall um, uh, at Yale. And I was very familiar having been there, seeing that being constructed, understanding that you provided something that what fit into the context, into the historical surrounding, took a fresh approach, and also was very innovative in terms of uh, the construction typology, the sustainable elements, that it felt absolutely uh, like Yale, even though it was a new vocabulary, a new architectural language. And it was that, in a way, that was very compelling for us, that you would that you would somehow get who we were yeah. and be able to translate that. And that was so important for this district because, um, you know, remember this, we didn't know, I mean, we're very fortunate now to have three buildings, you know, on the books, you know, Two that are one that's that's coming out of the ground, one that's going to start in the ground, and then one that's being designed, and maybe a fourth. When this site was selected, it was the landscape plan, and that's it. Yeah. So the importance of of that prominent site to be an entry to the district, um, as well as you know, be um, this hub for the school the community, the university community and the broader community was was very important. And, you know, I mean, we hit some bumps along the way. I mean, the design process is iterative, right, to, to suss out all the, you know, all the issues that, mm. that you have to deal with. And, you know, quite frankly, um, we weren't helped by the fact that as soon as programming was done, we were all sent, you know, to remote work, right? So we met on a weekly basis. Yeah. To, to do this design work and go back and forth. And it was a you know, challenge, I would say, and kudos to you and your team to get the culture of the place, you know, through through the internet yeah. was, you know, was um, a lot. I mean, Strangely uh, appropriate for a school of data science where you had a lot of data true, exchange. <laughs> true, but, you know, it's also a historical campus, right? Yeah. So it's a, a bit of, um, you know, a, a bit of a challenge there. But I think we got to an incredible place. Yeah. Um, and... In terms of the site itself, it sets the guidelines or it sets the, the you know, benchmark, for lack of a better word, for the buildings that are coming later. You know, we yeah. are working with every, all the buildings will be different somehow, but there's there's also a pa- material palette, you know, connectivity. There's a scale uh, that is um, significant. And I would say that we think about the fact that like you noticing this this morning about the importance of landscape. We are, in a way, a landscape-first campus, yeah. right? And that there's got to be this integration of landscape and architecture. And I think your building does that. It it acknowledges the 
the uh, beauty of the pond. It forms a very civic edge uh, to the site. Uh, and I think it's been very successful that way. Is that so, somehow how you were thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's a difficult project because, I mean, what's happening inside the building is kind of, in architectural terms, kind of manageable. It's not particularly uh, unusual. And we can think around that and we can talk We can talk a bit about how we've worked around that. What's happening on the outside is quite complicated. But I think because of the historic uh, resonance with the, the Jeffersonian piece, he put a new piece of campus together, which mm-hmm. is, you know, World Heritage Site and absolutely amazing. Um, and, you know, an inspiration to anyone doing any university work anywhere in the world at any time, I would say. It's just extraordinary. And so what are we doing? We're doing collectively a new piece, a bit like that, adjacent to that, joining north and central grounds. Um, but it's contemporary. It's not using that classical idiom. Um, it's surrounded by rows, a number of challenges. And yet somehow, if you're working here as an architect, you've got you've got Jefferson in the back of your mind. And and in the back of your mind also means I don't want to copy that in a lame way that's just not good. It's going to be a pastiche. So... Mm-hmm. For us, that was always an issue. How do you kind of reference that, but in a way that is is going to enhance the project and not actually drag it down? Um, and I think in the end, we've probably managed to find a way to do that with the with the portico at the front, which is very contemporary. But it's also that portico for me is a gesture. Well, uh, and we talked about it a lot, and it it. it we transformed that design collectively enormously, didn't we? Which was interesting. We were sculpting it and and remaking it and replaying it every week for months. Um, but what we've ended up with, I think, works well is to have those five bays facing out as a gesture about the about the school of data science, but also as a welcome to the whole Ivy Corridor. And it's sort of public space in that the public can see it. And the public can go in it. It's it's university space because it entices people into the other buildings you're going to do, and it's very much school of data science space because it's their it's their portico, it's their entrance. And then I think that the, what I enjoy about the design and I'm looking forward to seeing is that play on three dimensionality that takes you from the landscape through the portico into the building and then takes you up onto the staircase, which then turns back on itself to 180 degrees and then brings you out back under the portico Mm -hmm. on the front terrace, looking back towards Jefferson and and all that fantastic stuff. Um, And so that, for me, was quite a nice way of concluding that sort of reference to take you arriving from central grounds, come in, turn on the stairs, you go up the four floors and then be looking back from that terrace. So I think... Hopefully, we've managed to do something that integrates external and internal features and will resonate um, physically and symbolically, if you like, with the with the historic campus. But it is quite a legacy to have, isn't it? Have, <laughs> you've got to manage it and, it and everything you do, I guess, is seen in the context of that World Heritage Site. He's always looking over my shoulder. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's, I can't think of anything better to have looking yeah. over your shoulder, but yeah. yeah. So is it worth us just having a bit of a chat about um, the inside of the building and how it's how it kind of came together in three dimensional terms. I mean, how does how does the School of Data Science fit in the pantheon of um, other? I can say that for this in the in the sort of reference of the other schools yeah. and projects you have, and what makes it similar and what makes it different. It's yeah. a new school, which is exciting, um, but interesting to know. Well, it's it's true, and I think actually it's I think it's significant that. The School of Data Science, with all of its, um, you know, mission statements, school, you know, school without walls, et cetera, mm. and what it does in terms of welcoming, you know, all the schools in, being very inclusive, reaching out and taking students from every other school to be integrated, um, you know, in terms of its, uh, in terms of its mission and instruction and how data affects every, you know, school in in the university, um, and the uh, and how it plays in the um, major tenets of the President's Emmett Ivey Task Force, that the parcel, that the whole district was not to be necessarily owned by any particular school, right? right? That it was supposed to be something that was very inclusive, very diverse, the idea that the community uh, you know, could have access to this, the, broad, the university community and the broader community. And the fact that there's um, the, the um, 
major stair that goes through the atrium that just that does all the things you just described in terms of looking to the future, getting a, a view back to uh, Jefferson's grounds, the idea that there's the opportunity for intermingling and you know cross conversations along the way that it physically embodies you know the um, you know the mission and the you know major tenets of both the task force for the district and the school itself. The fact that the hub is on the corner that will be data science on display for the for the casual passerby, or that it might be such a it will be such a great space that it invites everybody in to, you know, have that convening space. So I think there's been a very careful placement of uh, and design of where those major public spaces are, you know, the hub or the corporate commons to enliven the um, pedestrian experience. So there's a lot of hope, you know, for the vitality that these buildings will be for the district at large. Yeah, I mean, you'd really hope that the energy from this building spills out right. to the outside. I think it's, I mean, it, w- it was interesting because we kind of, I guess, educational buildings are, at one level, the, the spaces in them are quite generic. You know, there's teaching spaces, there's learning spaces, there's classrooms, and they're fairly universal, aren't they? So what do you do to make this a particular, very particular to, to SDS? And I think the, the feedback we got from Phil and Arlen and everyone involved, which was, you know, really detailed, helped shape how we kit out that the set of parts inside and how we fitted out that building, which did also influence the outside shape. So we put the classrooms on the Ivy Road side so you could kind of get those bigger windows and they could be a presence on that street. Um, and then you we put, Active teaching, right? Active yeah, learning. You and, can and see to put this. that on display. Right, so exactly. the building starts to, to tell people on the outside what's happening on the inside, but it still, still works on the inside. And then we had, you know, generally the more cellular spaces on the outside where you've got individual offices, makes sense, and you can have ventilation and all the rest of it. And then as you go towards the centre of the building, more sociability. And I think it was interesting working in the pandemic because we were all so detached from each other All institutions were asking the question, why do we actually come together at all? Because we're all working remotely. And it's sort of even more poignant for a school of data science, but it re-emphasised that importance of exchange, avoiding too much hibernation, getting people out and getting social contact. And the serendipity of those conversations in research and academia are really important. So the building is highly sociable in the middle with those breakout spaces and gets kind of progressively more quiet and studious as you go towards the perimeter. And that that, that hopefully will, will work. And there's, a, you know, there's entrances at both levels on the ground floor, which will lead on to your next kind of building beyond and your, your corporate commons to balance the, the hub on the, on the ground floor and the various conference rooms. So I see it as being a very lively building. I sense it's a very lively faculty in terms of the people. They've got real focus and energy and a real sense of mission, I think. And hopefully that building can become a house, a home, where they can be productive but also very sociable. Yeah. So, can I can I come back to a couple of questions about uh, the the portico is one of those I think great inventions right because um, it's a it's a rather modest program I mean it's sixty thousand square feet more or less which is not one of our largest buildings but it's a nice sized building but to be at at the time we thought it was going to be the only building there yeah. and it had to operate not just you know as as a, a building unto itself but it had to be a very of, of a civic scale to provide this entry to the district, right? And so the invention of the portico is not only something that harkens back to a language that's familiar to us, but in mo- you know, in contemporary terms, it's a brise soleil, right? Yeah. It helps, it has a very sustainable uh, attribute to it. Can you, what, what's yeah, some I think, of the, well, I mean, you can see your this, attitude about that? You can, yeah, definitely, you can see this building from a long way away. So, you know, our floor to floor to floor heights are regular, you know, they're kind of normal for a modern contemporary building. So how do you make a bigger scale gesture on the outside? So when you look from far away, you're not just looking at four floors of standard floor height. And the the portico is a way of doing that, which gives you four floors, you know, and and the roof height um, and gives a sense of scale with these five bays. And 
with modern slats and, and louvers on the top gives you shading. So it will be, yeah, it's a threshold and it's a, a symbolic entrance, which you can see from, from a distance. And then we had one or two minor ca- games on the outside, didn't we? Where we pulled the Ivy Road piece out and responded to the, the shape of the road just to, to kind of break what would otherwise have been a very rectangular building. So I think sculpturally it's quite modest. I think in terms of sustainability, we made some good collective decisions early on, which is that the building should be the right size. We should make it work really hard inside. So we have... Efficient, right? Really efficient yeah. because, you know, the story on sustainability isn't just energy and use, it's embodied carbon in construction. So we have no basement. The plant rooms are really small. As you know, we've squeezed down all the service zones in the ceilings to absolute minimum, which has taken an enormous amount of work from the team to fit everything in. But if, if you're lazy and you don't do that and everything gets taller, you've got more space to heat, more space to build, more to pay for and more carbon in the construction. So making everything work really hard is, is something we like and is satisfying and it's good. And when you go inside the building, what you will find is it's, it's a pretty honest expression of construction. You'll see the, the steel and the columns, and we've kept a lot of effort, therefore, into how it's all jointed and detailed because you're looking at the real thing. Mm-hmm. There, there isn't a lot of covering on things because that's all materials. It's all carbon. It's not what we should be doing. We've got the right amount of acoustic absorption, and we use that to cover the services. We've got some lovely uh, timber slats on the ceilings for acoustics, and then we use the materials kind of very sparingly on the inside in a way that responds to the use so we've got a carpet everywhere which is good for absorbing sound but when you come in there's a lovely terrazzo and that will take you up the stairs and then there's areas of sort of wooden flooring to break out in the hub and corporate commons etc so I think um, it's it's not a massive building it's not a small building but I think it will it will have a lot of energy inside it and and contrast and interest so I think I'm hoping it's a good marriage between what I know about the department and their kind of what the people are like yes. and what the architecture is like. Yeah. So. And it sits in a district that, you know, has sustainable goals, you know, unto itself, right? I mean, the fact that it's overlooking this stormwater pond, right, that yeah. that uh, the district itself collects all the stormwater for all the buildings that will be, you know, surrounding it and that the district itself is a working landscape, right? So what we're saying about this development of the entire district from the landscape to the buildings that go on it are that we are – you know, very conscious of our carbon footprint and and the development of not, you know, I mean, we're in a low lying area. Yeah. It's one of the lowest elevations on grounds. And the fact that we have to deal with water, we've turned it into an amenity. Yeah. Right. So I think the fact that the building takes advantage of that, that it looks to those areas. I mean, one of my favorite and I can't wait to see this, you know, as it gets constructed. But there's there's um there's the analogy of this stair that you discussed before being the internal landscape of the building, right? Where we are on the Ivy Carter is relatively flat, or we've made it a little flatter, but that the topography all around grounds is pretty unique. And yeah. in a way, you've you've reconst- reconstructed that on the inside. You know, on the inside, with various lookouts to, uh, you know, I mean, every time you you come to a landing, there's a beautiful. Uh, window and a beautiful vista out to the landscape. And that's really important for us, uh, that there's this integration between the architecture and the landscape. I think uh, it is the most impressive thing about your campus outside the individual architecture is the topography, which is just gently unfolding everywhere i can't see anywhere that's particularly flat. we are in the piedmont yeah of the blue ridge mountains yeah. right and the, and these enormous trees everywhere so there's this this is vertical greenery you see everywhere and um i think that is fascinating and i think when you get the the dumont junks landscape in the corridor around the water it will be another place for students and, and staff faculty to hang out and it's interesting how much do you think that this building having started as block number one has then been referenced or will inspire or there'll be connections to the, the subsequent buildings that you're planning now? Quite a lot, right? Yeah. I mean, we are trying to, because we know that at least the hotel and conference center are being developed at the same time. We're trying to make sure there's coordination, right? Um, we're not, we weren't interested in having it, you know, like like the lawn has a continuity. It's designed all at once and then constructed over time. The idea of the Emmett Ivy Carter was much more of a city block, yeah. right? But that it needed to feel like UVA, it needed to feel like the architecture, so that it be design guidelines, so that the selection of the brick or the way you way the building meets the ground or the treatment of the windows is acknowledged. It's yeah. not 
replicated necessarily, yeah. but it's acknowledged in future buildings. Yeah. So, um, okay. Yeah. I mean, another, another interesting aspect about this project for me is that it's a, it's a new discipline and a new faculty. And it's kind of quite, it's quite outward facing in terms of industry. And, it, you know, it's a sh- almost like a shared resource you were saying before. Um, I'm hoping it will work, but as a member of the public or a captain of industry or someone coming here that wants to do business or, you know, join in or, or do a TED talk in the hub, hopefully the building in that location, uh, very prominent, very visible with the new corridor will be a sort of open invitation. And universities are academic, but they need to speak to industry, don't they, for, sure. for all sorts of reasons. Hopefully you see that working well. Oh, absolutely. And I think I think the prominence of the site you know, that you mentioned before uh, speaks to the importance that we put on the School of Data Science and the importance of data, you know, yeah. in our in our day and age, in particular, that that sets up as the head building, you know. Um, and yes, because it is so prominent, because it's off of one of what is going to be another major civic exterior space with the amphitheater around the pond, is going to absolutely invite. Um, industry to participate. It's just going to be a lovely place to be. Yeah. Um, and I and I think the idea that the MNIB corridor in particular is supposed to be a mix of uses, right, and be open to a lot of different people. That there's the School of Data Science, there's a hotel and conference center which will invite uh, a range of you know scholars and guests you know, from across the country, hopefully around the world, mm. you know, to participate. And then you're there on the site. The fact that uh, we will have an Institute for Democracy adjacent to that, you yeah. know, within, you know, stone's throw of the School of Data Science and hopefully a center for the arts right adjacent to it, that it's not just one discipline in the district. There's a lot of different um, subjects that can be explored, and hopefully there will be integration of the programs that that go through all of these buildings that will make the place and the building even livelier. Yeah, no, that makes it uh, when you contextualize it like that in terms of all the other subject matter on that on that new new piece of ground, that makes it seem really exciting. I guess um, it's quite interesting when you've you know we've kind of finished designing it, we're building it now, aren't we? Which is looking exciting. Have you ever finished design, really, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of go back and then want to change everything, if you're being honest. But um, you know, it's a good. Well, we, we've. I know. We've I'm fin- teasing. We, yes. we have finished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have finished. I think we're in a good place. Um, it's interesting to go back though and to kind of think, what did it turn out like you're expecting? You know, um, and just sort of reminisce about. I always have a thing on a project, which is because people are always telling you the ideas and things like that. And we are, we like to think we're open to listening to that. But as an architect, you have to be a filter. If I did a drawing at the end of a job where I took everyone's bad ideas and put them together, it would be mm-hmm. absolutely terrible. Mm-hmm. But hopefully we capture the good ones. I mean, I think for me, we started out and it was a kind of kit of parts. It was very in our minds, perhaps sort of factory-like, Andy Warhol rather than, and it was a, a school without walls. But I think it's probably come become a bit more conventional in through the process of understanding what people need to do to work, and that is have some walls. <laughs> the good fences that, are good neighbours. And right. I think it's, I mean, it'd be interesting to get your take on that, Alice, but, it, you know, how did it work out compared to your kind of your vision of how it might have looked at the very start? Well, I you know, so I think that we probably took the... Um, the analogy of a school without walls a little too literally probably in the beginning, right? We saw the opportunity there. And then I think you're right. People, you know, need privacy and need to have some uh, boundaries in order mm. to do that. So so I think we've hit a healthy compromise between those spaces and the workspaces in the building that will enable easy collaboration. The hub certainly is a place where people are going to come together. You know, the student, um, the student reading room up on the fourth floor adjacent to the Terrace, you know, yeah. the roof terrace is going to be one of the places where maybe it won't be, maybe it'll be a little bit quieter, but certainly it's a place for people to come together. Um, balanced against, you know, pretty modest offices for the faculty because you do need to go and be able to shut the door and do your thing. So yeah. uh, I think it's made great strides in terms of what we do, what we have done, uh, you know, on grounds in other academic buildings. It's probably hasn't pushed that envelope in terms of having all collaborative yeah. space the way we initially started it but you know that's that's again the process right we, yeah. we make incremental uh moves i think i mean every office project we do has that same discussion how right. much closure we work in 
open plan glass boxes. We are an architect studio without walls. It is problematic. I mean, we can't have any confidential meetings without going to another building we've had to subsequently build. Interesting. And then we have another kind of concrete box where all our nasty things happen, like model making and servers. So you have to be practical. Well, the other thing to have learned, you know, is that, you know, we come back, you know, my office is back intact, but we haven't given up Zoom calls, right? And so it's impossible to have different Zoom calls when you're in an open office, right? Yeah, the the hybrid meeting acoustic problem has yet to be solved. Exactly. And so so there's, I think, a way that we're, you know, edging towards, which is, you know, there are spaces that can be um, on a hoteling uh, program where you have private offices, you can sign things out, but that the majority of your work is done in open collaborative space. Yeah. One thing that just occurs to me (coughs) with this building is the kind of, the extra elevation, which is like the roofscape, if you like. And because as you go up Ivy Road, you get almost to roof level. So as you as you come back down, you'll literally be looking across the height of the building. And we have got PVs on the roof, which is part of the sustainability story. Photovoltaics, right? What did I say? PVs. PVs oh, but, yeah, photovoltaics. But, but, but sorry, the general yeah. Public, yeah, yeah, which will, which will generate right? a bit of electricity and seeing how sunny it is here, more than you would generate in London, which uh-huh. is good. And we, you know, we have got a series of measures inside the building for limiting energy use, you know, the usual LED lights, uh, movement centers, all that, all that good stuff. So it's doing its bit where we can. But also on the roof level, we've got a green roof that comes around the side. So I think it's a building that is going to be looked at almost almost from above when you look at the topography yes. around the well, site. Well, certainly from you know central grounds. You know, As I mentioned, I took a tour of the construction site of the Alderman Edition. And that from that reading room, you can look straight out at uh, data science, which is going to be pretty incredible. Yeah. So the, which made me think of something. Elaborate a little bit more on the operable windows that we have okay, and, so we, and the need for those. Yeah, so uh, it's always an issue when you have a building in a climate like this, you know, can you have natural ventilation or not? And the, the honest answer is it's very difficult to have that. You've got shoulder seasons when you, you can and you've got other times when it's too humid or too cold. So the real answer is to have your mechanical systems running in an efficient way. And we've got them very highly zoned in this building, so you're not running everything uh, all at once. Um, and when on the on the ground floor, we've got you know heated floors and things like that. So quite sophisticated. But in the individual rooms, it's going to be very nice to have windows that you can open and control your own environment. And we have those. And we've got some interesting materials you'll see as the building goes out where we're using a kind of Ocalux product, which is like a sort of almost translucent uh, insulation in, in the panels. And we've got glass panels. And as you know, we spend quite a lot of time looking at those elevations, which at one level are glass, white, and brick, all mm. the kind of hallmarks of, of, uh, of this university. But we've kind of played with them in a different way on the different elevations. So the to the east, you've got the, the portico uh, and some big windows and like a boardroom, conference room at ground floor and the hub and the main entrance, which is double height. And then on the south, onto Ivy Road, you've got the big classrooms, which are south-facing behind louvers to keep them uh, shaded. And then on the west, you've got a new building coming behind it at some point. So we have a small kind of re-entrant portico on there, just one floor high, made out of the brick. And then on the north elevation, overlooking the corridor, we've gone for a much more kind of contemporary arrangement of windows where we've got some double double height bays and we've got a kind of syncopated rhythm, is what we ended up calling it, where we've tried to... Um, express if you like the nature of the of, of contemporary you know uh, architecture and, and we're free we can do what we want we can move windows around we're not building it in the old way so we've got something which is you know a respectful brick box at one level uh, four squ- four square but we have had some fun moving the windows around giving it some energy and expressing on the outside partly what physically is happening on the inside the position of windows and rooms that gets expressed on the outside but it also is a pattern it's yeah. a design yeah. and hopefully something interesting and the building will look um, very you know very different from uh, day to evening you know, day to dusk to evening and um, I think will be very transparent uh, uh, during the day and very welcoming and be a beacon you know yeah. a, in the evening and that was also one of the critical factors that the hub and the double height windows are facing you know facing east. Uh, shaded by the you know portico and the Brie Soleil, but that would b- would signify a real beacon yeah. uh, for the district. So, let me ask you a question that um, I I know I have my answer for, but it's always okay. a question that I you know ask or that comes up when developing a new building. Tell me about um, your feelings about brick and the idea that maybe it was a, a given that we were going to use brick on this building. 
I, I mean, I love bricks. We absolutely love bricks at Hopkins, and we built some some very nice brick buildings. On the environmental side, it's actually slightly harder to justify using bricks now than it than it was before. I mean, not because they don't last. Um, but because there's quite a lot of carbon in firing them, so you've got to really justify using them. Hmm. Um, and I think on this building, um, it's a long life, loose fit building, and so the inside is interchangeable. It's still a kit of parts. Very flexible. Right? If you if yeah. if you decide, if Phil decides he doesn't want any walls, he can take them down. Uh, on the outside, it needs to last, um, and so we've we've got brick. It's incredibly robust. It's one of the very very few materials that looks better over time, which is good to know so i i think that's good i think where we would feel a bit uneasy would be if we felt we were sort of ended up using it in too much of a kind of reworking of a historic building and that would leave us a bit difficult because our architecture is pretty contemporary and i think for me at the end of it all when we've really focused in on all those challenges of internal activity space all of those things I like to think that the build, if you took the building off that site and put it somewhere else, it would have no meaning whatsoever, no sense. And I think we've probably got to that point. It's very carefully crafted to that location. It's completely different from what we did at Yale or mm-hmm. Princeton or Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge. And for me, it, my ambition at the start and our office's ambition would be that this building belongs to you and to, to the school. And hopefully, I think we've tailored it to, to do that. Yep. And... Um, Let's, let's, let's hope so. <laughs> no, I think you've got it right. You know, I, I usually say that the, the material is not going to prescribe the, um, the language of the architecture necessarily, even when I get, yeah. you know, sometimes eye rolls, but it doesn't have to be brick. You yeah. know, you scratch the surface here and you get red clay, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. It is of the place. Yeah. And so there's something beautiful about, um, you know, a building that looks like it's, it's come up of the place and that, and that idea that it belongs to us. It's not only about just the materiality, but it's what you've done in terms of the proportion, about the uh, orientation of the windows, et cetera, et cetera, that, that I agree with you. It does, it, you couldn't move it from the site, and it is going to feel like a UVA building. Let's hope so. so anyway. <laughs> well, nice talking to you. Same here. Thank you, Thank Mike. You. Thanks for checking out this week's episode. We'll be back on November 1st with a conversation within the area of systems. If you'd like more information about the future home of the School of Data Science, visit our website, datascience.virginia.edu. There you can find articles, photos, media, and renderings of the future building. We'll link to this, as well as the Hopkins Architects website in the show notes. As always, if you'd like to contact us, send us an email at uvadatapoints at virginia.edu. We'll see you next time.